Good morning. I'm going to take the liberty to sit where Apostle Paul sat since he warmed up the chair for me. I thought that'd be a nice thing to do. Uh, seriously, uh, I don't want to uh, weaken and fall. So I am here. Uh, I may be a little weak, but uh, my spirit is healthy and happy. And I'd like to share today, our theme is uh, to speak truth to power, as you've heard. And it's an exciting and an adventurous theme. And I'd like us to go through this adventure kind of together and look at, uh, at how this theme fits into the month as well. So I looked at the August themes in the old days, uh, and I'm kind of old, so I can remember the old days. They used to have monthly themes and weekly themes. Now we have weekly themes, but when I looked at uh, the themes for these weeks in August, I looked at kind of labeled the whole month as being the miraculous. And our first theme for the month was blessed by generosity. And we studied the miracle of the loaves and fishes from Matthew 14, thir verses 13 through 21, where Jesus fed 5,000 people with five small loaves and uh, of bread and two fish that were donated, at least as I was taught as a, as a youngster, that were donated by a child that uh, offered and, and uh, brought his gift to Jesus, who then fed 5,000 people. We learned that in that Sunday, that God is not a God of scarcity, but God is a God of miraculous generosity. And that was a wonderful miracle that, uh, that we studied that day. Our second theme for the month was, why do we doubt? And we studied the miracle of Jesus walks on water from Matthew uh, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, where Jesus walks on the water and invites Peter. To, in fact, he didn't just invite Peter, he commanded Peter to uh, walk with him. And Peter got up out of the boat and started walking on water too uh, for a while until Peter doubted. And then when Peter doubted, he began to sink and Jesus saved him, pulled him up and put him back in the boat. And the tempest that had risen uh, was uh, stilled and calmed and again, I look at that as a miracle, and it was that God is a, in miraculous command of all the elements and had more command than we are used to seeing. And today our theme is to speak truth to power. And uh, we will examine Matthew uh, 15, 1 through, 1 through 28. Uh, that's not the suggested theme. The suggested uh, scripture theme was a smaller pack, uh, package of those verses, but I want to go to verse one and study it because it may, makes more sense in the, uh, in the overall story. And um, in, in many cases, I've heard uh, ministers say, you know what? Let me change that scripture citation because I don't like that scripture citation. It's a hard one to speak on. It's a hard one to preach on. You'll see in a minute. And we would oftentimes run the other way if somebody asked us to bring a sermon on these, on these verses. And that will make some sense in a minute. Uh, in these verses, Jesus may not always sound like the Jesus that most of us would expect. But I think that we can study deeper into these scriptures and maybe see something arise that makes more sense and does sound like the Jesus that we're used to hearing about. And uh, we're going to study deeply. And uh, the adult class, by the way, the adult theology class is studying this where we look into the scriptures deeply and get meaning that, that might not come to the surface reader. And uh, so we'll, we'll look at that. And here I'm going to say that this is a God of hearts, 
miraculously made new, hearts miraculously made new. And let's journey this together. The subject heading for this uh, um, chapter of, of, uh, of Matthew is uh, that which defiles. Uh, some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus uh, from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Uh, they don't even wash their hands before they eat. Well, my mom taught me, wash your hands before you eat. So that's almost like God saying, wash your hands before you eat. Uh, but this was seriously something that the Pharisees brought up and, and uh, accused Jesus of having little regard for what was supposed to happen when, when we would eat. And Jesus replied and said, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your own tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses, and that is to either say or do bad to their father and mother, is to be put to death. This is in the scriptures. And Jesus told the Pharisees and teachers, why do you ignore that? Uh, because, and in fact, why do you try to subvert that? Uh, because you do tell people uh, something that they probably shouldn't do. But you say that if anyone declares that they might, that they have something that might be used to help their father or mother, and that uh, resource is devoted to God, then don't give it to your father and mother, even if they're hungry. Don't give that resource to your father and mother. This is what the Pharisees say. <laughs> and this was what Jesus was accusing them of. And that if it's just said, it's devoted to God. I'm going to give this money or this food or this resource to God. Then don't give it to your father and mother. So if you're going to give it to the temple, that, that's good. And they were not to honor their father or mother with this. So thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, not your like everybody, but your, hey, Pharisees and teachers. So I'm going to take an aside for a minute. And I think you'll tell, you'll be able to tell when I'm not reading the scripture, but when I'm talking about the scripture. And the Pharisees interpreted the Bible and decided that if the sons would tell their parents, we've decided to give our money to the temple, then we can't give it to you and not even give it to you for food to keep you alive. So Jesus responds to their criticism with something like, you have your own criticism where you don't live up to what the scriptures say. And the scriptures, and now we have the Bible, then they didn't have the Bible. Now we have the Bible. Uh, the scriptures say one thing very literally, but you Pharisees use your idea of the scriptures uh, to interpret differently and say that your rules are better than what's in the scripture and apply over biblical command. So Jesus then goes on. You hypocrites, talking to the uh, Pharisees and teachers, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The, they worship in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. So now we get to the things that defile, and these are the scripture uh, readings that were actually uh, recommended. So I'm going to pick up now with that. Then Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, uh, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth like eating without washing your hands. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached Jesus and they said, um, do you know the Pharisees took a lot of offense when, you, when they heard you say that? And Jesus answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. 
Well, now think that's kind of a tricky statement there because uh, God's the creator. What plants are there that God didn't create? And what Jesus is saying, if something comes from mankind, it can be uprooted. What comes from God will not be uprooted. And so he's trying to tell them, uh, pay attention to what, what we've said. And Jesus said, uh, let them alone uh, because they are like the blind guides guiding the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both of them will fall into the ditch. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Now, the disciples, I love them. God bless them. But sometimes they were a little slow getting the messages that Jesus talked about. And this is one of those times. Um, and I love how Peter, he's, he's just such a good one. Uh, I, I love how Peter is so openly honest. I don't get it, Lord, that kind of open honesty. It really brings it lets the scriptures repeat something in a way that Peter can understand. And guess what? Sometimes that repeated message is something that Jim might be able to understand. So I, I'm glad Peter's doing this for us. Uh, so Peter, thank you for asking. Uh, but then Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that what goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes to the sewer. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. What we say comes from our heart and our mind. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile. Sorry, mom. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to tell her that. She can read it herself. Uh, so anyway, uh, so far, the scripture story has not yet been miraculous, other than it's a miracle that they finally got the message through to the thick, the thick minds. Uh, so far, it's not been miraculous, but I think it sets up for the miracle that is still coming, coming because I think a miracle does come. You see, Jesus has been teaching his disciples a principle, and again, again, they didn't get it. And Jesus is saying to himself, in my mind, Jesus is saying, I still got to get this message through somehow. So Jesus uh, teaches, and honestly, this next passage is where many of us who do sermons do not want to get involved because uh, the first image, the first reading, the image we get of Jesus is not, doesn't sound like the Jesus that we know and love, but I think it is. And I think we can see it, that it will be. So bear with me for a bit. I'll try to interject some aside comments as I have, uh, but I'll try to also make it pretty clear when I'm not speaking the scripture. So Jesus, still teaching, as usual, uh, moves forward. The next verse is titled, uh, the next set of verses is titled, The Canaanite Woman's Faith. And Jesus left where they were uh, ministering and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And Jesus knows that they're crossing this is me speaking again. Jesus knows that they're crossing into a different tribal area and that they will encounter Gentiles. In those days, Gentiles were hated and reviled and considered subhuman by the Hebrew society. Uh, does our society have people, groups, and believers that maybe we identify as unworthy or worth less? or even subhuman, we might. So anyway, let's get back to the scripture. Just then a Can Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Uh, but Jesus didn't answer her at all. 
And not speaking to her was normal for the Hebrew social structure. That, that This is expected behavior. Now, we look at it, and on the surface reading, we look and say, man, Jesus is being rude. That's why we don't like this, because we don't think of a rude Jesus. And, and uh, Jesus is not necessarily being rude, but in a way, he's showing the people around him. Their own, he's mirroring their, their beliefs. He's mirroring their practices. He's, he's doing what they would expect Jesus to do. And the disciples came and urged him, saying, uh, send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. Now, this woman's shouting at them, and they see Jesus doing the expected thing by ignoring her. Uh, you don't talk to women that you're not related to in that, in, in that uh, uh, time period. And then the disciples say, oh, now we're feeling our oats now because he's behaving the way we expect. Now we got Jesus learning the right way to behave. And then they say, okay, send her away, dismiss her, because that would be an acceptable, an acceptable form of behavior. <clears throat> but Jesus didn't send her away. He continued his teaching moment. And Jesus answered her when she shouted and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, again, that's, that's expected behavior. I mean, they're thinking, oh, he's telling her that we're worth more than she is because he's here to minister to us, not to her, not to her kind, not to her type of people. He's here to minister to us. So they're, they're feeling puffed up. Their way seems to be working. And again, this would be socially accepted behavior. And, uh, and yet the disciples encouraged Jesus to act in the normal, socially accepted manner and command her to go away and dismiss her. So continuing with the teaching moment, uh, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in this way, he's going along and seeming to endorse this social behavior. And uh, what did the lady do? She hurried, hustled, and got in front of him and knelt down in front of Jesus and said, Lord, help me. It is not fair, and Jesus answered, again, socially accepted, socially expected behavior. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. You see why ministers don't want to preach about this, because this, this doesn't sound like Jesus, but it does. In a minute, maybe we'll, we'll pull this out and see. So food for children who count should not be thrown to dogs who do not count. And this is again, still socially ex accepted and expected behavior. But in spite of being dismissed, this woman knew who Jesus was, knew the real Jesus from his reputation and believed in the things that people had said about him and her faith that, that Jesus could help her and that Jesus would help her and would heal her daughter. And she pressed Jesus. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Okay, I think at this point, Jesus has shown the the expected behavior, the socially acceptable behavior, has shown where that gets you. And now Jesus is dealing with a believer. And finally, Jesus looks at the woman and answers her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that moment.
that starts sounding like the Jesus that we know and love. And Jesus was teaching a lesson to the people who thought they were better than her. The people who thought they were better than her were expecting him to continue down that road with a, without acknowledging her. And yet he acknowledged her. He healed her daughter. And, and she was made whole. So let's review this scripture. If this looking at the scripture this way is anywhere near accurate, then now we do have a chance to look and say, this could be a miracle because Jesus may have been showing the need for those people to change their hearts. The miracle may be in their heart. The miracle may be that they saw, oh, our way isn't the right way. Our way doesn't end up with children who are healed. Our way ends up with greater dissension between diverse people. So what does it mean to speak truth to power? You stand up for what's right and you tell people in charge what's what, how it is. That's the idea behind the phrase, speak truth to power. And, and it's an expression for courageously confronting an authority and calling out injustices that happen on their watch and demanding change. Sometimes you talking, uh, preaching, speaking truth to power isn't to talk to a powerful person. Sometimes it's to talk to a powerful social point of view, social acceptability. Sometimes you stand up to that social acceptability and you say, that's not right. We don't do that. That's not right. The expression speak truth to power implies a moral imperative. That's, that means you have to, you have to do this speak truth to power, uh, and you stand up for what is right, especially to powerful people or social norms, national leaders, and even, uh, even when it's not the easiest thing to do because the people all around you expect different behavior, but it's not the behavior that we want to know and love from Jesus. So speaking truth to power, your beliefs don't make you a better person. Your behavior makes you a better person. So let's talk. Truth to power does not always mean to speak to kings, prime ministers, and presidents. It also means, and may even more so, mean to talk against social norms and against socially accepted ideas, against common acceptability. When I was a little kid, uh, and I'm not saying that this was speaking truth to power, but I was taught to not tell my grandma Klein about my friend Jackson. Now, Jackson's not the Jackson that we know and love in our congregation. Jackson was a friend of mine back in the 1800s. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't supposed to tell grandma Klein because you see, Grandma Klein didn't believe in having friends like Jackson. But then sometimes we have to speak truth. We have to stand up against that kind of belief, behavior, and normalization. And I have to break that chain or I end up continuing it. Um, Many of you know that I've had, well, my dad's passed away now, but uh, when they were alive, uh, there were times when I didn't see eye to eye with my parents, and I'll call it their politics. It wasn't just po political, but uh, all of us have political, social, and religious feelings, and mostly we hold these very deeply. But it is important even for things we hold very deeply that we don't allow ourselves 
to become rabid, where we're toxic. We need to have our deeply held social and political beliefs, but not get toxic. I need to be able to sit in a pew next to somebody who believes this way and somebody who believes that way, and we worship together. I need to be able to go to HEB with people who believe this way and believe that way, and we purchase things together. I, I, I need to have that. So that would be ways that we can stand up against the socially acceptable things that aren't the ways of Jesus. So we need to not be rabid. I must, must, must show equal respect for the other person's opinions as what I would hope that they would show towards my opinion. If I don't do that, I shouldn't have that opinion. I shouldn't have opinions, but I want to have opinion. I want you to have opinions. And I want you to sit here and hear with me as we worship together. I'd like to give you an invitation. I want to invite you to work today, now, and uh, for, for our existing future to embrace the kingdom of God on earth, in fact, in reality. Don't just hope that when we pass away, we'll go to heaven. That's, that's not bad. I'm just talking about let's bring heaven on earth today. That is what we're called to do. Jesus walked among these people and said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is yours. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I believe in Zion. As much as I believe in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, as much as I believe in those God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, I believe in Zion, which is a name that we call the kingdom of God on earth. It is open to all. It is an invitation to everyone to live there. You don't have to be baptized to live in a Zionic condition. Oh, it may help, and it may be your ultimate destiny, but you can live in a Zionic condition, loving each other. And we, each of us, every one of us, is not only called to enter, but also invited to practice the lifestyle of, a, of eternal life of heaven here on earth. And this is a fundamental of our enduring principles. All people are worthy. We heard the lesson of the Canaanite woman who was totally worthy from her very moment of birth. And her daughter was totally worthy. All are worthy. All are called. There's a place for you in the kingdom of God on earth today in reality there is a place for you. you are called to fill that place and you have skills and you have talents and you have capabilities that only you have and zion's not going to be as good a place without you living that way and us we are called to reach out to heal and to minister to those who meet the description of that Canaanite woman, our homeless, our immigrants, our diseased, our afflicted, and I could go on. We, you and I, are called to minister to their needs. Converting them is not part of the equation. Jesus did not convert the Canaanite woman. Jesus healed her daughter. It's as simple as that. We are called to minister. Continuing revelation. Well, I've wanted to talk about this a little bit because I think that what happened in the last couple of weeks I've been working on this sermon is that some things were revealed to me in the study for this. I didn't 
say two weeks ago, have in mind looking at Jesus's behavior as being teaching moments where he was trying to walk his disciples down a path of, of understanding. But in looking deeply into the scriptures, I came up with some of these ideas. It's looking at some of the wordings and some of the meanings that were that are there. And uh, this goes through a, a, a process called exegesis, which is to look into the scriptures and try to bring out of the scriptures what wasn't necessarily written down because there either wasn't room or they didn't know that that was important. Um, and that, that's a way that you can continue to have the word of God revealed to you. We make wise choices, and I would ask, invite you to choose. You can choose and begin to find ways to speak truth to power. When the power is the social power that we see around us in social acceptability, this is our theme today. You and I to speak truth to power. The expression speak truth to power, remember, it, it implies a moral imperative to stand up for what is right, even stand up against social acceptability. Not easy to do. And even when it's not the easiest thing to do, it is still a moral imperative. Let's live lives that speak very loudly and proudly truth to power. I love you, each and every one of you. And um, that's listening, uh, that's here, that's listening, or that will listen to this in the future. Thank you.